So I'll get started with a couple of questions of my own and then I'll throw to the audience, so get yours ready. Uh, my first question is, how did you come to this story, one that I've never heard of? Yeah, so, uh, you know, when I made the film Red Army, I was uh, promoting it at, at, at festivals and Steve came up to me after one of the screenings and, and said, you know, I have this crazy story about this Red Army team. And right away I kind of pushed him back. I said, no way, I'm not, you know, doing another story about Russia or, or hockey and 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 I was like grossed out by the idea of even th thinking about it but Steve basically convinced me to give give me my my address and so I did and he sent me this big box of material you know filled with like videos and photographs all all the documentation I mean Steve kind of hoards stuff and and basically I couldn't believe a that he he had all this stuff but uh, I started looking through it and I was just like my eyes just like got wide and I was like this is crazy I can't believe you know a I've never heard about this I didn't think anyone had ever done anything about this and uh, but r r again I kind of pushed it away and gradually it, the story just kept pulling on me and pulling on me that I knew it was this wild story that had to be told that I knew it could be just like so dynamic with you know during that time period was so unique in terms of history and, and, and a country going through such an extreme change so quickly. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this crazy sports deal, which the premise to begin with is insane. I mean, in the military owned team that mm -hmm. was the pride of Russia, all of a sudden is bankrupt and has to come to America to basically bail them out and save them. And, and, and the, you know, Russians are very prideful. And the idea that this was even an option was insane. So, mm -hmm. I, I kind of got lured in, I got fished in, and I decided to interview Steve just to kind of see what kind of guy Steve was, and, and was he, could he kind of, you know, anchor the film? Was he interesting enough? And, you know, we <laughs> saw what we saw, so that's what happened. I mean, that's how it started. Then I ended up in Russia, and I didn't have a single interview. I went there kind of... The whole movie, when I was making it, I was, like, r reluctant, because, you know, I just... I don't know. It was like something that gravity just kept pulling me forward. That I have to do this. That I, I just I, this story is too good. Uh, you know, I just have to keep finish it. Keep taking one more step mm -hmm. and raising my. So that's kind of that's that. Got it. And Steve, you are very interesting. I'm curious about why it is that you wanted this film to be made and why you wanted to participate. Uh, I just I'm a big documentary fan, so I thought this would be a great subject. But also, I felt that um, the reason we went to Russia was to create harmony between our countries. So Nixon used uh, ping pong diplomacy with China, and naively I thought we could use hockey to unite the two countries. And I was dead wrong. Yeah, but I mean, come on. But Pittsburgh's had a had a had a agenda, right? Yeah, I mean, there, it was twofold. One was to make money on the new Russia because all the new companies were streaming into Russia, all the multinationals. Um, the other reason was player personnel. They felt if they could get the kids when they were kids, really young, six, seven, eight years old, get them into the Red Army program, mm -hmm. then we would have the first shot at them. Yeah. Got it. Any questions from the audience? I will repeat the question for the benefit of everyone in the room, starting with you. Yes. And was there ever a plan for you to go back, Steve? Was it not part of the dramaturgy, or did it seem too risky? Quick answer, no. Um, <laughs> no, we learned our lesson, and uh, I, I wouldn't go back now either. Um, I think it's with the weird Donald Trump, uh, Vladimir Putin love affair that's going on now, I think it's even more toxic, and the Cold War is getting worse now. Um, as a matter of fact, America is starting to look like Russia, in my opinion, with, in terms of media and how we approach the, uh, the fifth estate. So, yeah, no, things are bad, and I don't think much has changed, really, in 26 years. Mm -hmm. But you have been back since. Yeah, I've been back. I did some work for uh, Russian Fashion Week. I got into the fashion business for a while. I was a little safer. Um, <laughs> and, um, and actually, I'm going to represent the top Russian in the NHL right now, Artemi Panarin, going to handle his marketing for the Rangers, yeah. Cool. Yes, go ahead. Uh oh. What was the craziest thing that you saw in your time there? Well, this also plays into the Donald Trump scene. Um, when you get to Russia, 
they have uh, these crazy bars that are really just brothels. They're just they're they're prostitutes inside of the bars. You pay a hundred dollars to get in, and and this is commonplace. Um, so every multi every foreigner that comes into the country gets roped into these really publichni domas, they're whorehouses, but they, they look like they're really bars and restaurants, but they're not. So I think that's, that's something crazy that's pretty standard over there, yeah. Hmm. Yes, go ahead. Murder, yeah. I know, <laughs> yeah. it's okay, that was um, clear. <laughs> no, we, you know, I don't want you to think that this was all strippers and beer, because it wasn't. I mean, most of the promotions that we did were honoring the deceased legends of the Red Army. Um, as a matter of fact, one of my favorite stories w involves Vladislav Tretiak, the great goaltender, arguably the greatest ever. And we retired his number 20, and he pulled it up to the rafters in the arena. He was with his wife and his kid, and he came up to me afterwards and he said, isn't it ironic that it took an American to honor a Russian in his own country? Because in Russia, it's all about the system and the team, and you're really just a replaceable part in their machine. So Russia never honored their legends the way we do in Hall of Fames and with retired numbers. We brought all that to Russia. So it wasn't all just tits and beer. It was, it was serious promotions and, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, I guess either of you, this question could apply, but... <laughs> okay, two <laughs> answers. Like, yeah. uh, when I went in 1993 to 95, I was single, no children. Uh, so now I have children. I would never go back now because too much risk. Um, we were just, you know, naive, crazy kids. So, no, I learned my lesson, and I don't think I will do business in Russia. Yeah, I mean, I'll answer that, too, about documentaries in general. I mean... I think every one I've made and I look back and, and if you ask that question, I, honestly, I wouldn't. It's that, it's that kind of, the process is that kind of grueling and crazy that by the time you get to the end of it, it's just you can't comprehend doing those same things. But as you're going up that like mountain, it's just like one step at a time, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, we're glad that you pushed through. Yeah, so the question is about how different this film is from one of Gabe's previous films, Red Army, uh, and what it was like to work on this film. Yeah, well, I knew, well, first of all, you know, I, I, as I said earlier in the thing, I, I really don't like to repeat myself. I, I, I'm, I'm just grossed out by it. So I, I just knew tonally that this was going to be a totally different beast. This is like a dark comedy that's just insane and wild. That one's more of kind of your epic drama that, that covers the rise and fall of this country through kind of brotherhood and friendship and kind of, you know, sweeping politics. You know, this is kind of like unhinged more. And I, and I, I kind of, I, I, in a way I did like kind of that they, it was about the same team. How could it be the same team, but just so wildly different? That's kind of a cool thing to do. Um, yeah, I mean, but I, I, I just, with this one, I really wanted to kind of get at the differences, because here you kind of have the American perspective mm -hmm. and the coming into the Russian perspective and the clashing and sort of I could examine how different the cultures are, how people behave, well, how they think, you know, the, the, how the society conditions you to, to think certain ways, you know, and exploring that, not necessarily a factual way, but I could, I could kind of let the camera... Uh, almost, you know, undress the subject, like, in, in psychologically, you know. A lot of times you can't really describe uh, the way someone is or their behavior psychology, but you feel it. You really feel, mm -hmm. 
like when Gushin's laughing in the movie, like I, I know what he's, you kind of feel his, his thing, what he, that he's got something inside him that's sort of darkness, you know. Well, we all have that little, little bit of evil, you know, but I don't know. So that's, I don't know if I answered your question, but. Yeah, and it's extremely timely, obviously, and mm -hmm. you did a great job of balancing both the humor and the terror. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you for that. Yeah. Yes, go ahead. Did he still have like the, that oh. legendary thing? Yeah, so the question is, who was the best player when you were there, and did Tikhanov still have it? Okay, the first question's easy. Um, our best players were Nikolai Habibulin, the goaltender who you saw in the film. Uh, you saw Sergey Breland. Both of them are Stanley Cup champions. Sergey Breland won three Stanley Cups with New Jersey. Uh, he was a second round pick, and Hebby Bullen went on to win with Tampa and was an NHL All Star. We had two first round draft picks also the next year uh, Harlamov, the son of Valeri Alexander, who you saw in the film, and also Jan Golubowski was a first round pick for Detroit at 23. Um, so we did have some young talent. Um, also, Andrei Vasilyev played for the New York Islanders. That was another one of our stars. Uh, Sergei Samsonov came right at the end. He was one of our young players, and actually Yeltsin got to see him play when I was there, and I remember from the president's box, he gave the thumbs up to the young Sergei Samsonov. That was nice. Uh, in terms of Tikhanov, um, Tikhanov ruled with an iron fist. He had the relationship with the army, and I think he was past his prime. Uh, the players did not respond to him. As a matter of fact, um, not to disparage his family name, but he was a bit of a racist. Um, I remember we had an Armenian player, and I was watching a practice, and he was screwing up, and he started screaming, you know, chorny, bliat, nigger, you know, black, nigger, you know, Armenian, it, very scary kind of stuff that if this happened in America, it would be, you know, lights out. So, yeah, he was, a, he was an old communist. Um, and at the end, though, he softened up. And um, I actually saw him in Vancouver, at the Olympics, I was promoting Sochi 2014 um, at the time, doing their press. And um, I remember he came up to me and he said one of the nicest things. He said, many have, come, many have come to Russia after you left to try to do what you did, and no one has come close. So that was a nice thing, and he sort of softened up at the end. Wow. Yeah. We have time for one last question. Any final takers? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, great question. Um, for a year, this Meek Radin, this strange partner, um, they stepped in and took over, um, and the team was really flatlining. Um, you know, the crowds left. I blew up all the sponsorships on my way out, sort of like Jim Brown in the Dirty Dozen when he was bombing the <laughs> shit out of the Nazis. Um, I have Coca-Cola, gone, you know, McDonald's, <laughs> gone. I didn't want them to have all my work. Um, but then they got lucky because the, t the company Norilsk Nickel that was owned by Vladimir Potanin and uh, Prokhorov, who ended up buying the Nets, um, who still owns them, the, the, the Brooklyn Nets, yeah. Um, they ended up buying the soccer team, Seska Soccer. They also ended up buying the hockey team. So the Russians really lucked out. They had got a couple billionaires come in and save them. And by the way, just so you understand, Putin makes it imperative that any oligarch support sports. So these teams lose about 40, 50 million dollars a year in operating expenses. And, but you have to own the teams or else you're not going to get the pipeline deals and you're not going to be able to keep your money. Or you'll end up in prison like Khodorkovsky. Yeah. Okay. Unfortunately, that's all the time that we have for today. Thank you guys so much for coming to see the world premiere of Red Penguins. Thank you for making Thanks. and bringing Thank the you. film here.